Okay, so in this video, we're going to keep talking about everyday life for Europeans during time period one. Uh, so our main focus for this video is going to be on family life. But before we get to that, there's one more topic that I wanted to get to, and it didn't quite fit into either one of the topics for the video. So I'm just going to kind of throw it in here real quick. And that's the idea of... Uh, Witch trials. So, witch trials are kind of a product of the unstable social and political and economic environment. of the late 16th century. So basically what people were looking for was a scapegoat. People were looking for a scapegoat and the easiest scapegoat were old, widowed women. Now, that's not the only group of people that were attacked in witch trials, but this is the most common group of people, uh, mostly because they often lived alone and kind of relied on kind of, I guess, folk medicine as a means of income. So when we think about like your typical Halloween witch, they're old women and they usually have like some sort of like cauldron. This is very typical of someone who would be kind of an old woman who lives like on the fringes of society. They might live outside of the town, maybe in the woods. They would rely on folk medicine as a way to make income because they don't really have any other skills and they lived alone. They had no one to stand up for them. So they were easy targets. And it was very easy to associate what they're doing with uh, the devil or with unnatural elements. And so they became the scapegoat for all of this stuff, all of the bad social, political, economic stuff going on at the time these old women were the, the scapegoat and they were attacked and usually killed. Uh, it didn't fix the problems because the problems weren't caused by these women, but the, it was a very easy out group to attack. So it was very easy for the, the town to blame all of the problems on these old women uh, and unfortunately, a lot of old women, but not just old women, but usually older women without any family, they were attacked and they were usually, uh, they were usually killed. Now, remember, it didn't fix anything, but that was, that was what happened. Um, okay, so the main topic after we've talked about witch trials is family life. What did it look like to be, like, what was family life like for a regular person in time period one in Europe? Remember, most people were poor peasants. And so that's pretty much what we're going to look at here. What was life like for a poor peasant? Um, typically, they lived in one 
big room. And there was one big bed that they all slept in. And from time to time, there may be somewhere between uh, 10 to 15 people living in the house. So they lived in one big room, they all slept in one big bed, and probably somewhere between 10 to 15 people at any given time living in the house. Now, it depends on what's happening uh, because the number of people living in the house may change depending on what's going on in the world around them. So you've got the nuclear family. So mom, dad, and kids. Uh, you've got maybe uh, grandparents, but more than likely they're gone, they're dead. You might have, depending on how well off you are, maybe a couple of hired hands, people to help you out on the farm. Uh, maybe some people passing through, so there might be lodgers, like people using the places like a Airbnb. You might have people just passing by, stop for the night. So depending on what's happening, you might have all sorts of different people staying in your one big room. Uh, parents typically had as many children as they could. Parents typically had as many children as they could. Uh, you know, eight to ten children is not weird. Eight to ten would probably be average. And the reason for that, two-thirds died before adulthood. So two-thirds of those kids would have died before adulthood. And only the oldest would stay on the farm. Only the oldest stayed and inherited the farm. Uh, we'll talk about the ones that died in a second, but uh, younger, younger kids, if they survived, stayed until they were old enough to find work and left and never came back. And you've got to think about this in terms of these people's ability to travel. Uh, they might find work on a nearby farm. They might find work in a city far away. But it's not like it was easy to travel. And it's not like a house had an address. So even if you wanted to keep in touch, and you'll see why they don't in a minute. But even if they wanted to keep in touch, it would have been extremely difficult to do that, mostly because most people couldn't read or write. And working people didn't really travel 
at all. In fact, most people didn't travel at all. Travel as a hobby doesn't start to show up in Europe until like maybe the end of the 19th century or the 20th century. So travel is not a thing. So if you left, you left and you never came back and you were kind of forgotten about. Because the other thing you've got to keep in mind is that death and loss were common. This stuff was common. So you might be sad for a little while, but then you got over it. Death and loss were so common that it wasn't weird to just forget about people. Now, towards the end of the time period, towards the end of the time period, families had comparatively fewer children. So instead of eight to 10, we might see four or five children. This might be to uh, save money, be more financially secure. Because before you needed eight to 10 kids because you needed help on the farm and you weren't sure they were all gonna survive. So you had to have a lot of kids. But as the time period ends, we see fewer kids because people are delaying marriage to save money and be more financially secure, which is kind of like what we're seeing right now with people of that age. Right now we're seeing people delay marriage and delay having children because of the instability in the economy, it's kind of the same thing as what was happening in Europe around this time. Now, let's talk about the kids that died. So what befell kids? So what happened to the two-thirds of children who didn't make it to adulthood? Now, obviously, the, the, biggest, the biggest killer of children was disease. That was very common. Children died of disease all the time. That was not weird. Uh, but there were lots of other reasons, too. So, for example, uh, neglect was a big killer of children. Like, there weren't babysitters. There were no babysitters. You still needed to work. So, like, you don't want your child to get hurt, but you also don't have anybody to watch the child. So, sometimes uh, wild animals might run off with a baby. Sometimes a baby might uh, stumble as they're learning to walk and stumble into a fire. That happened. So it's not like every child died of disease. There was also a lot of neglect because the parents needed to work. If they didn't work, they would starve. And so unfortunately, Stuff like this happens to children. But again, death and loss were pretty common, so you get over it. In fact, these things were so common that parents 
didn't even name their children. They didn't name children until they were sure the child would survive. Until that point, they called the children, uh, they called it it, or my personal favorite, the creature. So they wouldn't name their child because chances are the child wasn't going to survive. So better to not get attached. The same reason why you don't name farm animals because more than likely that farm animal is going to get eaten. So you don't name it because you don't want to get attached to it. But if it's going to stick around, eventually you do need to name the child. And so they wouldn't until maybe the child was like maybe four or five. Until then, they would just refer to it with these fun nicknames. Um, <clears throat> also in the house, don't want to forget these guys. Uh, you might also find, in addition to the people, you might find a lot of livestock in the house. And that was to protect them, not the people, to protect the livestock. To protect them from theft. Not to protect the people inside the house, but to protect the livestock from thieves. Um, marriage during this period, marriage among the poor, was for economic necessity, not love. So you needed and you needed a partner. You didn't have like a soulmate, someone that you loved. You needed an economic partner to help you live. And that's what marriage was. Marriage was an economic necessity for the poor. It wasn't something that you did because you loved the other person. In fact, most of the time you didn't love the other person. So you had to do this if you were going to live. So children were also a necessity. Now, because of this, of this mindset, domestic violence was common and often expected. for husbands and fathers. So it was expected that a husband would hit his wife or hit his children. That was part of the job of the husband or father. Now, in this kind of lifestyle, it's super common that family members hated each other. So it's not weird when we think about a child leaving and never going back or never contacting their family before because they often hated each other. The, the poverty, the lack of privacy, the violence, all of that stuff leads to everybody really resenting and hating each other. And remember, there's only the one bed. So you have to sleep next to the people that you also hate. And for those of you wondering, uh, the special hugs happened right out in the open.
It just happened in the bed. There was no privacy. So everything happened in front of everyone else. There was no getting around it. That was just the nature of, of life. Now, family life was a little bit better if you were rich. If you were richer, family life was a little better. Uh, there was less poverty. There was more privacy. Uh, children generally survived. Although without really a lot of attention from their parents. But as you get richer, the patriarchy becomes more pronounced. So despite all of the problems of a peasant's household, one thing that wasn't there was the patriarchy. In poor societies, men and women are more equal because they need each other to survive. But as you get richer, you don't need the women to survive, so the patriarchy becomes more pronounced. And it gets even worse if you're in a Protestant society. In Protestant societies, women lost their one opportunity for advancement, which was to become a nun. Protestant societies didn't have nuns. There was no, so in these societies, there was no equivalent for women. Women needed to know how to read so they could read the Bible, but that was it. There was no other option for women. So in Protestant societies, their only opportunity, they can only become a wife slash mother. In Catholic societies, they had one additional way out, which was to become a nun. But in Protestant societies, there aren't nuns. There's no equivalent of a Protestant nun. So the only option for women was to become a wife or a mother. Now, they're a little bit more educated because they need to know how to read, but really, they don't have any other social option. There's no social out for them. The only thing they can do is be a wife or a mother. So, as this, as this time period comes to a close, the role of women in society becomes a kind of hot topic.
and this is only a big question for the wealthy, it doesn't really matter for poor people, but for rich people, what role in society do women play? So, like, what is the role of education? Should education be something that women get? Should they learn a trade? Could they lead religious services? These were all questions that philosophers and thinkers and, and other kind of educated people are trying to figure out what role should women play in society. I think everybody kind of agrees that they should be educated, but for what point? What's the purpose of the education? So mostly the education answer is generally yes, with reservations. For these other two, the answer is generally no. But this debate, and it's a wide-ranging debate, has a name. So this becomes known as the, make sure I'm spelling this right. The Corel des Femmes, which in English comes out to be the women dispute. Now, most philosophers during the time said that women should be controlled by men. Uh, but there were a few exceptions. So most uh, Renaissance and Reformation thinkers believed women should be controlled by men. But there were a few exceptions to this. Uh, they're not great exceptions, but there were a few people that thought differently than this. Uh, for example, uh, our old friend Castiglione agreed but also argued there really wasn't a reason for it. Like he said it was completely socially constructed, that there wasn't a good reason that women were controlled by men. So he agreed, but he couldn't really explain why it should be that way. Um, Another person who I'll mention here, kind of put this off to the side here. This guy, his name was Heinrich Agrippa. He actually argued the other way. He said that women were purer than men and thus closer to God. So he said that men were made from dust, but women were made from men, which means that women are more like God than men are. So they kind of, they were the last thing created by God and thus maybe like God's most perfect creation like the thing that he spent 
the longest perfecting, like that was the last thing he got to. And so he was the best at creation by that point. Um, but generally speaking, most Renaissance and Reformation thinkers did not believe women should be uh, a part of society. Uh, most Protestant thinkers believe that women should be educated, but simply to read the Bible. They shouldn't be leading religious services. In fact, most Reformation philosophers argued that women should simply read the Bible and that's it. They should not be involved in anything else. Uh, so for right now, I think that kind of ends this topic. Uh, we'll do one more short video about a little bit more art stuff. Uh, so kind of post Renaissance art. Uh, but I think this is the last major thing in the time period so until we get to that last video about art, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.